One blow don't tread upon another's heel. So fast they follow. Your sister's drowned, Laertes. Drowned? Where? There's a willow grove of slant to brook that shows his four leaves in the glassy stream. There, with fantastic garlands, she come of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples that liberal shepherds give a girl. <laughs> but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. There, on the pendant bough, her cornet leads clambering to hang. An envious sliver broke. When down her weighted trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook, her clothes spread wide. And mermaid like, while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes. As one incapable of her own distress, or like a creature, native and endued into the element, long it cannot be until that her garment, heavy with her drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious leg to muddy death. How happy some or other some can be! Through Athens I am thought as fair as she! But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all that he do know. And as he errs doting on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his qualities, things base and vile holding no quantity, love can transpose into form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. And therefore is winged Cupid painted blind? Nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste, wings and no eyes figure unheedy haste. And therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled. As waggish boys in game themselves forswear, so the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he hailed down oath that he was only mine. And when this hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved, and showers of oath did melt. I will go tell him of fair Her Hermia's flight. Then to the wood tomorrow night will he pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his sight thither and back again. Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown! The court of soldiers, the scholars, I shall sword. The expectancy and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mold of form, the observed of all observers, quiet, quiet down. And I, <laughs> a lady most adept and wretched, that sucked the honey from his music vows, now see that even most noble and serene reason, like sweet bells, jangled, <laughs> out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth, black. Oh, woe is me, to see what I see, see what I see. I me. She speaks. Oh, speak again, bright angel of thou art, as glorious to this night o'er my head, as a winged messenger from heaven, unto the white upturned wandering eyes, like mortals falling back to gaze on him, when he bestrides to the lazy passing clouds, and ailed upon the bosom of the air. Romeo, Romeo, where art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or, if that will not be, but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Shall I hear more, or shall I speak of this? Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hands, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, when he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo, doth thy name. And for that name which is no part of thee, take all my stuff. 